Welcome everyone to the virtual world of the Eastside Freedom Library. Um, taking advantage of Zoom that enables us to have our featured presenter this evening from Toronto. Um, Shinoda-san has already crossed the ocean, uh, but he's in Boston, which is a pretty good distance away. Um, it's great to see you all. Um, we try once a month uh, to have a labor history discussion. Um, our ideal situation is to read a relatively recently written essay and have the author of the essay with us. Um, this evening, that's Jenny Carson. Uh, and Jenny is joining us from Toronto, uh, where she's an associate professor of history at Toronto Metropolitan University. Uh, and she's the author of a, of a fairly new book in the wonderful uh, labor history series from the University of Illinois, uh, a book titled A Matter of Moral Justice, Black Women Laundry Workers and the Fight for Justice. Um, it's the first book length examination of laundry work and laundry worker organizing uh, in the United States. Her articles have appeared in a number of scholarly and activist journals. Um, and we're just delighted that Jenny is with us. And, and if I could ask you, Jenny, would you introduce our special guest this evening, who's also joining us? Yes, I'd be very happy to. So in the box beside me, not sure where it is on your screen, is uh, Beatrice Lumpkin. Hi, B. how are you? Um, so B is a star uh, of, of the book, uh, a star of my story. She's also a very, very dear friend at this point. We met, um, I have to say, we're going on 15, 16 years at this point. And um, I, I was starting research on my book on laundry workers. And I came across this article uh, in the, in the uh, people's uh, world. Uh, written by B about organizing laundry workers in the 1930s. Those are my kids. I told them they had to come for a few minutes before bed. <laughs> They're nicely in their pajamas, showered. Hi, guys. Say hi to B. Um, and I reached out to B. She emailed me back immediately. And um, I have been fortunate to interview her for the book and um, more importantly, to become a close friend. So uh, B began her activism in the laundries in the 1930s when she was a teenager. Uh, by then she had joined the Communist Party. She's still a member today. And she went on from the laundries to um, a number of industrial jobs. And she eventually became a mathematics professor at Malcolm X College in Chicago. Now, while pursuing uh, a diverse uh, career, she also organized and remained an activist for civil rights. Uh, she's a founding member of CLU, the Coalition of Labor Union Women. Um, she's an active member, uh, was and is an active member of the Chicago Teachers Union, uh, of SOAR, the Steelworkers uh, Retirees Organization. Uh, most recently, she founded Intergen. She helped uh, found Intergen, an organization of retirees and younger people who are organizing uh, together around um, issues such as social security, free tuition, um, Black Lives Matter, and on and on and on. And she is going to be 104 in two weeks. On August 3rd, it's her 104th birthday, woo. And um, I recently visited her in Chicago where I gave a talk about my book and um, she is indeed an inspiration, and uh, I'll let her. She, she's gonna. She's gonna say some words tonight about her experiences in the laundries, and um, uh, and beyond. And uh, yeah, that's that's B in 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 a nutshell. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you, Jenny, and and again, thank you, B, for joining us. I think our plan is um, Jenny is going to do a bit of a PowerPoint. Um, just in case not all of you did your homework uh, and, and did the reading. So we'll have a basis to work from. Um, and then Jenny will involve B where it seems appropriate. And then we'll go to questions and comments. So um, Jenny, go ahead and 
I am just pulling it up right no. now. Sorry, I ended up losing it for a minute for some reason. Okay, okay, okay. Where are you? Sorry. Um, here it is. Here it is. Okay. Okay. Sorry, it's slowly loading. <laughs> okay. Let me know. Okay, where am I? Let's go. Okay. Can you see this now? Yes. Okay. And is it on presentation mode? Um, yes. We're, we're going to get us Ryan there. Said, there we go. Perfect. Is, okay. Excellent. Perfect. Okay. So thank you so much. So um, yeah, I'm really excited to be here tonight to talk to you about the book and, and really to talk to you alongside um, alongside B, who, you know, who, who lived this history, and I just have the honor to, to write about it. Um, and of course, I, I had to start with a picture of B. Uh, this is her at the age of 10 in 1928. Um, she starts organizing in the laundries about six years later. Um, and then beside this is a picture of her at 97 in, in 2015. She is still organizing. And I had to include this picture. This is B voting. Um, in the 2020 election, this, this went viral. It's in the Washington Post, among other places. Um, she's in a hazmat suit constructed by her grandson to keep her safe from the pandemic. Um, which, uh, and of course, she believed it was absolutely essential to vote in this election. And she described her vote, obviously, for Biden as a vote against fascism. And obviously she was right. Um, so B plays a starring role in my book, A Matter of Moral Justice, Black Women Laundry Workers and the Fight for Justice, um, from which the article you might have read. If you didn't, don't worry. I'll give you a synopsis now, is drawn. And the book was many, many years in the making. And um, it began as a history of laundry work and laundry workers, a group about whom relatively little has been written. And when I started this, I, I was talking to Peter, I was really surprised um, that there was so little written about laundry workers, um, given that by 1930, the industry employs a quarter of a million workers nationwide. You know, so this puts it alongside, you know, the auto industry, the garment industry. Um, and really interestingly, it is the largest industrial employer of Black women in the United States by 1930, um, far surpassing both the garment industry and the tobacco industry. So I was, I was surprised uh, that we didn't know more about them. And um, I became quite you know, interested in, in telling this story uh, as a way to fill a gap in the literature and also as a way to understand why certain kinds of labor become raced and gendered, you know, and what that means for the workers performance performing uh, that labor. So the first question I, I sought to answer was, was why do Black women come to um, play such an important role in this industry, you know, at a time when most other industries refuse to hire them? And um, the first three chapters of my book answer that question, but just super quickly for tonight, it has a lot to do with the really awful conditions in power laundries. This is hot, sweaty um, work. Uh, workers burn themselves on on the iron machines. They, they develop rheumatism or respiratory issues from, from the heat and the humidity. Um, those who are handling the incoming dirty laundry are sorting through um, laundry, you know, full of uh, feces, full of um, broken glass, cockroaches. Um, it's really, really difficult work. Um, you can see here, this is a, a loader who's loading up the washing machines, uh, the, these big drum-like contraptions. They're constantly overflowing. You know, the workers talk about standing in puddles of water while they're, while they're working. Um, and you might have noticed from the pictures that, that what happens in the laundry it is very quickly a, a, a rigid race and gender-based occupational division of labor emerges, like we see in other industries. And within the plants, um, white men work as as head washers. Uh, they earn the most money. Um, they are often assisted by black men. Um, outside the laundry, um, white men work as drivers and again, often assisted, and this is, you know, in keeping with Jim Crow practices, by black men. These are, so head washing, driving, these are the jobs held by white men. They pay the most, they have the highest status. Uh, black women, in contrast, work primarily in the ironing department. These, um, you know, these are jobs that create some of the worst working conditions and they always pay the lowest wages. 
And, you know, I would be remiss if I did not say that this occupational hierarchy has to a large extent remained intact today. Um, and, I, and I also want to point out laundries haven't disappeared, right? Industrial laundries still exist. Um, and I know Daisy Pitkin, I believe, came and talked to this group um, a few months ago, and she, she's, she's been writing about um, industrial laundries, and um, Sintas is one of the largest ones, and they continue to hire primarily white men for driving, right? It's the outward face of the company. They earn higher wages than the mostly women and people of color who still work inside the plants. Um, okay, so, you know, in large part it is the really difficult conditions, the low wages that enable black women to get access to jobs and power laundries. It's also history, right? Um, if you've read, if you've read Tara Hunter's wonderful to join my freedom, you know that, you know, since the early days of slavery, black women had been washing clothes for white families, right? And that's something that persists into the post emancipation South, when, you know, even the poorest white families will find the money to send their laundry out to a black laundress or washer woman as she as she was called. And, um, you know, so I argue in the book that that laundry work is this quintessentially racialized labor, whether it's done in an industrial setting or whether it's done um, by hand in private spaces. Um, but, but the other point that I make early on in the book is that, you know, as terrible as this work was, as difficult as it was for, for African-American women who are largely shut out of industry, it actually represents a small but really important step up the occupational ladder, an opportunity to get out of domestic service, right, which is the occupation that employs the vast majority of Black urban women in the first half of the 20th century. So what we see is Black women actively trying to get jobs in power laundries, where they earn higher wages, um, they enjoy the solidarity and camaraderie of co-workers, with whom in some places they'll form unions, um, and because they leave behind this isolating and, and sexually vulnerable, vulner, or, or, sorry, sexually vulnerable conditions of household uh, work. So really central to this story is Black women's agency, right, in terms of um, how they make decisions about their wage earning within, an, within a labor market narrowly circumscribed by race and gender discrimination, and also in how they challenge their working conditions. And so this is, the, this is you know, the heart of the book is how they resist. Um, and, and everywhere they worked, um, they, they challenged their conditions, both, you know, informally, through spontaneous acts like, like singing on the shop floor. Um, I have you know, many accounts of, of Black women singing spirituals on the shop floor, um, doing it even when the boss says they can't, um, and also more formally through unions. And when, um, and when my book starts, my book starts in the early 1900s and the industry kind of explodes in 1910, 1920, um, the unions and the laundries are the international or sorry, the Laundry Workers International Union, this is an AFL affiliated union, and the Teamsters. Drivers go with the Teamsters in most places, and the inside workers go with the Laundry Workers International Union. So we have this really traditional craft union division that works to the advantage of the drivers, right, as a way to keep women, to keep um, Black men out of their occupation. Um, and, uh, Oh, sorry, I just jumped ahead of myself. And um, I, again, I have to say that this division is largely intact today, right? Drivers today continue to organize in many places with the Teamsters and laundry workers with other unions, the inside workers with other unions. Okay, so um, the, the Laundry Workers International Union has a very tiny membership, is not very active. Um, it's headquartered in Troy and it's sort of not really um, doing very much. And so the women self-organize. And two of the women leaders of the laundry organizing in New York City, and this is the focus of my book, are uh, Charlotte Adelman and Dolly Robinson. This here is a picture of Charlotte Adelman. It's the only one I have of her. She's really, really camera shy. And, and that's, it's too bad. Um, she migrates from Port of Spain, Trinidad in 1924 at the age of 19. Um, she's joining her married sister in Harlem. 
And um, she goes to work in the laundry, like so many other Black female migrants to the city. Um, when she moves out on her own to Brownsville, Brooklyn, she gets another job in a laundry. And she quickly emerges as a grassroots organizer. And she goes to the Teamsters, who by this point, by the late 1920s, are organized. The drivers have, have a Teamsters local. And she says, hey, I want to organize the inside workers. Can you help me? They blow her off. And so she says, okay, I'm gonna do it myself. And she starts holding meetings in her Thatford Avenue home. There's just a handful of workers. And from there, she helps build a movement. Her coworkers describe her in reverential terms. She is a fierce nationalist. She's a militant fighter, uncompromising in her commitment to economic and racial justice and black self-determination. She's famous for wearing um, a suit, a tie, a fedora. She cuts her hair short and an afro before it's popular to do so. Um, and the stories of her militancy are legendary. Uh, the five foot two Adelman is, um, is celebrated for using the headbutt which she would, um, she, she would use it against a boss to, to throw him on his back all without ever lifting a finger. And, and the workers say, oh, you know, she imported this from Trinidad. And uh, when the workers, you know, talked about her and, and, and sort of framed her, her, her militancy, they always mentioned that she was a Garveyite. Um, and, you know, she comes in, in the 1920s when the Garvey movement's at its height, when, when we see Marcus Garvey um, and Garveyites, you know, taking over the streets of New York City in full military regalia, demanding racial justice and respect, right? And this is just as audacious at the time. And, and you know, Adelman brings that um, militant Garvey posture to her organizing and also, you know, her own personal history as a migrant from a Black majority island with a long history of militant left-leaning racial and economic activism. So I locate in the book her organizing and other Caribbean uh, laundry workers who who really come to the forefront of the campaign, I, I locate this organizing within this broader pattern of Caribbean radicalism, right, that's been identified by Winston James and others. Now, her her sort of co-organizer is a woman named Dolly Robinson. Um, she's here in the striped shirt. And I think labor historians know a bit more about Robinson. Um, while working in the laundries um, and while working for the union that I'll tell you about momentarily, she goes to law school. <laughs> she does it at night. She does it in the afternoons. Um, she goes on to hold a number of uh, high level posts uh, in the government at the state level and in the federal government. She, she works under Kennedy in the Women's Bureau of the Department of Labor and, and Kennedy has tapped her for this. Um, she, she's part of um, what historians now call um, labor feminism, mid 20th century labor feminism. And um, she moves to New York with her mother in 1930 and um, as a teenager goes and works part-time in a laundry. And um, she, she uh, it's in the early 1930s that the laundry start erupting, right? With, with organizing and, and strikes. And she is one of the main organizers, but she talks about how, how her coworkers, who are a lot of them are older women, would always send her away before an arrest was about to be made. And she was so mad and she would come back and keep organizing. And she described those who were arrested as aristocrats of the movement. Here she is later in her career um, with, a, with yeah, she becomes actually uh, the secretary of, uh, the, the labor secretary for New York State. Um, here is um, a pivotal strike in 1934. This is the laundry, the colonial laundry where Dolly Robinson works. Um, when the strikes happen, you know, her coworkers send her away. She comes back and she says, listen, I want to be arrested. You're an aristocrat of the movement if you were arrested. Um, it's in Brooklyn where Adelman and Robinson meet each other, where they become allies and where they meet leaders from the Women's Trade Union League. And the Women's Trade Union League is a very critical supporter of the laundry workers. This is uh, the labor feminist organization founded in 1903 as sort of the female counterpart to the AFL. This was a really interesting organization. It had working class members like Roche Schneiderman, who is a Jewish socialist. It also had upper class allies like Eleanor Roosevelt. 
And Eleanor Roosevelt actually becomes a huge supporter of the laundry workers um, when there is a big strike during the big strikes in Brooklyn in the 1930s. Uh, Roosevelt uh, lends the laundry workers her secret service agents to protect them from the thugs who have been hired to beat them up on the picket lines. Um, the Women's Trade Union League also uses uh, to quite positive effect um, uh, their elite allies during the strikes of the 1930s in the laundry. So we have um, we have Cornelia Bryce Pinchot, who's the wife of the governor of Pennsylvania, comes to the laundry um, picket lines in Brooklyn. She arrives in her limousine. She's wearing a fur coat. And of course, the media comes out. And um, th this is a picture of the big brigades in 1909. They're also active then during the garment strikes. And um, you know, they're quite effective in generating, you know, sympathy and shining a spotlight on the abusive conditions in the laundries. Also significantly, the laundry workers get huge support from the Communist Party. Um, and this is, of course, where I intersect with, with B, who is a member of the party, and also her good friend, Jesse Taft-Smith, who um, both of them are born in um, communist, uh, union-oriented, uh, Jewish families and they're they're brought up with labor as as we can tell you in our own words in a minute and um, they both work in laundries as do other communists and um, in the 30s when the workers are engaged in in these massive grassroots mobilizations the communists uh, who are working there you know send out the message that you know this is an industry that is erupting and the harlem section of the communist party really focuses on supporting these workers um and you know it's not surprising right that that we find the communists in the laundries it's a it's it's a large black workforce this is you know the communists uh, uh, you know are, are prioritizing racial justice this is a moment when they're active in you know, the campaign to free the Scottsboro Nine, the nine black youth accused of raping two white women in Alabama. So the communists um, are quite active in the 30s. And, in and this is a picture of B. And in fact, they, they um, alongside, alongside other uh, laundry workers, form a short-lived laundry workers industrial union. This is kind of like a counterpart to the AFL laundry union that's not active. And um, and they they do incredible organizing, and you know I, I argue that the the grassroots mobilizations of of black laundry workers led by shop floor militants like Adelman and Robinson, with support from radical communist organizers, really um, really leads to organization in 1937. So the laundry workers, and this is a picture, this is a wonderful picture of um, Jesse Taft Smith and it um, highlights the very militant tactics the radicals were using in the laundries alongside Adelman and Robinson. So um, Jesse chains herself to the mezzanine pillar of the Taft Hotel, which has been taking in laundry from um, a plant where workers were on strike. Um, now, in 1937, this, or, or, or sorry, in 1935, the CIO is born and the laundry workers, um, you know, uh, the laundry workers decide in 1937 to, to leave the AFL, such as it is, to leave the AFL Laundry Workers Union and affiliate with the CIO. And this is an obvious choice, given how little the AFL had done for them. And also because, you know, I, they were already organizing industrially. They were already organizing interracially of their own accord, right? And they were already using militant radical tactics. So joining the CIO with its promise of inclusive um, progressive unionism made a lot of sense. And um, a few, and, and this is all happening really quickly in the summer of 1937. Soon after joining the CIO, they get an industrial union charter, Adelman pays for it. Um, or, or, or largely pays for it out of her own money. Um, the Amalgamated Clothing Workers of America, uh, led by Sidney Hellman, comes to the laundry comes to the laundry workers and says, "Listen, we're, well, you 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 can affiliate with us. We're offering you jurisdiction," and the laundry workers um, agree to to join the AFL and become one of their affiliates. And um, the uh, affiliation with the ACWA is useful in some ways. Um, they provide a lot of resources. 
They're able to hire 30 organizers, including B, including Jesse, including Dolly Robinson and Charlotte Adelman, who just fan across the city. And at this point, you know, the workers have been organizing now for, for many, many years, in some cases, decades. And, you know, they rush out. B has um, this great story about, you know, they would go around to the plants and the workers would rush out to them and say, hey, CIO girl, we want a union too. They would rush to the union headquarters to sign union cards. And so um, very quickly, uh, very quickly, New York's laundry workers are brought under affiliation. They're brought into the union. 30,000 laundry workers win union contracts under the ACWA. And um, this is a huge victory, right? And I won't go into the details of the contracts, but they get higher wages, shorter hours, um, rest periods, paid holidays. They set up impartial arbitration ma uh, machinery to resolve grievances. They win a closed shop. Um, so that this is a significant victory. And one I will say the CIO and ACWA will take credit for. So if you read the traditional accounts, the ACWA says, oh, we, we came and took this poor and demoralized workforce, offered them affiliation, and then they, you know, organized. Well, you know, I argue that in fact, the interracial activist solidarities had already been built, right, by, by radical organizers, um, communists, by black workers. And, um, and the ACWA comes in at a moment when um, when the workers are, are, have already have already self organized. Okay, so I had originally planned to end my book here. 1938, 30,000 laundry workers organized in New York City, affiliated with the Garment Union. Um, they're all under collective agreements. But I started looking ahead, and I didn't like what I saw. And I had a feeling there was a really important story to be told about what happened after affiliation. Um, and very quickly, because I know I'm talking, um, I'm, I'm going on too long as I always do. Very quickly, affiliation is complicated and it comes with a lot of drawbacks. The ACWA exerts very, very tight control over the laundry union. They appoint the union heads. They almost always choose a white male VP from the garment union. Um, they impose a very bureaucratic um, business unionism that privileges labor peace and stable contractual relations over meaningful gains at the bargaining table um, or racial justice for black workers. When the employers violate the contracts and they do, there's no post-war social accord for the laundry workers. Um, the unions had the union heads tell them, oh, just be patient, give it time, you know, go, go through the grievance process, even when that proves inadequate. Now, this kind of depressing uh, trajectory of business un unionism is not uncontested. The workers put up a huge fight in the 1940s. Initially, they have the support of B and other communists who um, who organize um, largely within a Brooklyn local that's under communist control. Um, they demand greater union democracy, um, more representation of black workers, and um, they are kicked out ostensibly for uh, trying to impose communism on, onto the union and for not following ACWA policy. And so I argue that this, this um, they're kicked out in 1941. I, I argue that this is really what we're seeing here is a prelude to the events of 1949 and 1950 when the CIO ejects its 11 left-led unions. And the ejection of the radicals, I argue, was, was a real loss for the laundry union um, in terms of the leftist commitment to rank and file democracy and racial justice, a struggle that continues after they leave but would have been enriched by their participation. So the, so, so the struggle is led in the 1940s by Adelman and by Robinson and by a group of about 10 Black laundry activists who Robinson calls the Democratic Initiative. And in the 40s, the Democratic Initiative will um, demand that the union challenge the racist hiring practices that see uh, Black women confined to the ironing department. They demand you know, equal pay for equal work. Uh, they demand that Black people be allowed to ascend to the highest positions in the union. Um, and and, their, and their, their racial justice focus extends beyond the union. Um, during and after the war, 
Black laundry workers participate in marches against segregation, against police violence. Um, they write. Um, they write in support of the struggles of um, Ethiopians. We see this sort of pan Africanism emerging, and I argue that that the laundry workers' civil rights unionism. I describe it as a civil rights unionism. Right? They're demanding not only economic rights but also racial justice, gender equality. Their civil rights unionism. Um, it, it's part of this sort of broader, um, you know, civil rights organizing that's taking place in the North, um, organizing that historian Jacqueline Dowd Hall has described as the first decisive phase of the modern civil rights movement. So the laundry workers are part of what, what scholars now term the long civil rights movement. Now, this civil rights unionism brought them into conflict with the leadership of the union. Um, Adelman uh, is suspended twice in the 1940s, um, in 1941, and again in 1949 for insubordination. Both times she has called out uh, the head of the laundry union, who in both cases is a VP from the Amalgamated. She's called them out for racism, um, for doing racist things like removing black officials and replacing them with white officials. Um, is she, when she's suspended in 1949, she's out of the union. They make it impossible for her to return. Robinson suffers a somewhat less brutal fate. She is um, removed from her position as education director and assigned to organize in the South, part of the doomed Operation Dixie. Both women understand that they have been banished from the union for their civil rights organizing in a legal document prepared by civil rights lawyer and activist Polly Murray. And this is incredible. Polly Murray is friends with Adelman and friends with Robinson. And Adelman hires Polly Murray to represent her against the union. She considers suing the union um, and, and ultimately decides not to. Um, but there's a really thick, incredible file at Harvard University in the Polly Murray papers on Charlotte Adelman that is very eye-opening. Um, and in her resignation letter that's in the Polly Murray papers at Harvard, uh, Adelman insists that, quote, she's been ousted for her opposition to the second class treatment of black workers and her refusal to play the part of handkerchief head Negro to the white male union leaders. So Adelman and Robinson are out of the union. Um, it is taken over by a man named uh, Louis Simon. Uh, who is standing up here next to the podium. Louis Simon is a driver. He was around in the 1930s. He helped kick out uh, the communists. He's an anti-communist. Um, he also helped kick out Adelman and Robinson. And he it becomes uh, head of the union in 1950, a position he holds until 1982, when he finally retires in his 80s. Despite rampant allegations of racism, uh, levied by black workers against Simon, he goes on to have an illustrious career as a civil rights hero in the labor movement. He serves on numerous boards, the Urban League, the National AFL, CIO, Civil Rights Committee. And this is a picture of him in 1961, receiving a, a Distinguished Service Award from the New York City Central Labor Council at, Waldo, uh, at, at the Waldo Historia, Astoria. And meanwhile, I should say, outside there are picketers from the Harlem-based United African Nationalist Movement calling out Simon for racism and calling out the laundry union um, for engaging in, in racist practices towards its majority Black membership. So it's not the happy ending I hoped for, right? Like, <laughs> sadly, you know, in some ways, too bad I didn't end up I didn't end in 1938. It's not the happy, happy ending I hoped for. In 1966, after 30 years of no strikes, close to half the union membership makes less than the minimum wage set to go into effect. Um, so we can see here in this history, uh, as I finish up, some of the reasons for organized labor's current challenges, right? Including worker distrust of unions in the face of post-war bureaucratization and persisting patterns of racism. But the history of the laundry workers is also a story of resistance and hope. It's a story about how some of the most exploited workers came together during the depression to build an interracial and industrial union that brought the city's notoriously anti-union employers to the bargaining table. The workers organizing and activism was rank and file led. It was militant, it was intersectional, anti-racist and community-based. Their unionism connected economic rights with racial justice and gender equality. 
And strategically, they deployed militant tactics that included acts of civil disobedience that put the employers on notice and help build the interracial solidarities necessary to sustain the movement. Um, I recently read a review, um, and I just ordered the book, of Joe Burns's um, Class Struggle Unionism, in which he makes the case that we have to, that, that labor, that workers have to get back to this kind of militant, confrontational, rank and file led unionism um, that, you know, that the laundry workers engaged in, but which, you know, has been suppressed and held down by labor bureaucrats and by the law, right? And, and the last thing I'll say is, you know, the laundry workers had the law on their side. B talks about how the organizers would open each meeting by reading a copy of the Wagner Act, right? The workers um, felt that they had the support of the state. And so, you know, I, I, I think in this story, you know, we, we, we can see we, we can see some some insights and in organizing today. And I think that we're seeing an organizing today um, of return to the, these kinds of, of, of tactics, um, uh, you know, being deployed by women, by people of color who are today leading some of the most militant battles um, for economic and racial justice. All right. Um, I always go on too long. My apologies. Thank you for... <laughs> sticking with that and I would love for for B to weigh in weigh in if if you'd like <laughs> and I'm gonna stop sharing great well <clears throat> if I may at this point uh, I'd like to pick up with Jenny ended by talking about some of the possibilities today that uh, are mindful of the uh, ferment that came out of the depression that came uh, out of the first organizing of industrial union. And that has a lot of impact on the issues of racism, for example, um, and also uh, speaks to the influence of an example of the Communist Party. Uh, in fighting the Scottsboro case of 1932, which resisted the uh, legal lynching of uh, nine teenagers, and uh, laid in many ways the foundation for the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 1960s. The concept of organizing a plant uh, or a factory or an office not by crafts, which were then highly segregated, now a little less so, but all the crafts together, all the trades together. And that went a long ways towards uh, breaking down of the um, racism that was reflected in every part of life in the United States. There was an upsurge of the working class that I uh, illustrated, uh, you know, got me right here in my heart when I was in. I had a pile of uh, leaflets to deliver to this laundry and uh, workers uh, 
sat outside sank from 12 to 1 for the traditional lunch hour. They didn't work just eight hours, by the way. Uh, when they said, hey, we want a union too, didn't know my name, CIO girl. I feel that now, and I'm really inspired by what many of the young workers are doing. Uh, I feel the possibility of a huge expansion of union organizing. Uh, but again, we've lost so much ground in the United States. Uh, the whole Cold War period uh, had its reflection in the labor movement by the expulsion of 13 of the most active and biggest unions by the CIO. That happened in 1949. Um, but the fact that the majority of young people under 30 is it, but there have been a number of surveys favor socialism over capitalism. Uh, I think has a real impact on the possibilities to organize now. The working class has changed in many ways. It's much better educated, many sections of it. And it's not accidental to, in my mind, that a lot of the urge to organize is taking place in places like uh, uh, the phone uh, stores where technicians uh, advise you when you come in with your iPhone or um, so uh, I, I don't feel I work with something, even though we lost so much ground under the McCarthy period, and uh, mentioned the Cold War. I believe in the United States uh, it had a much worse effect than in Canada, where uh, the McCarthy period was not completely duplicated, and union membership has remained higher. Uh, but that red baiting is not as effective anymore. And um, my hope for defeating a fascist takeover in our country, which is such a real imminent uh, danger, it rests in large part on the increasing radicalization uh, of our youth, and especially in the way they are rejecting the attempt to divide people along the lines of racism. The fact that Black Lives Matter has taken the initiative and so many young white people have joined them. It's to me the most encouraging thing going on. And before I get off, 
Oh, now I remembered my microphone. I hope if you, I hope you heard me. <laughs> uh, before I get off, I want to thank Jenny Carson so much for having written about the laundry workers. And one of the things that makes me feel so bad is they're not that much further ahead than when we began organizing them in the 1930s. Uh, and I think that's a real duty of the labor movement to uh, affect those working conditions. And I think it's out of date now to demand $15 an hour, probably should be $20 an hour. And on that point, I'll uh, also be glad to answer any questions. Ooh, not that much time left, sorry. Oh, thank you, thank you. And Jenny, thank you. Um, so let's um, open up for, for questions and comments. I encourage everyone to turn your videos on um, so that we can see your beautiful faces. And I see that, uh, Natasha, you have your hand up. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, I noticed when I um, the opening slide showed a picture of the laundry workers organizing in 34 in Chicago. And that was the same still that was used in the opening scene of the uh, independent film Union Maids. And I see Jenny nodding her head, yes. Um, and the laundry worker in that film was Sylvia Woods, who was affiliated with the Communist Party, as were the other two women. Uh, this was an independent film done by New Day Films in the late 70s. And uh, I showed it uh, when I taught women's studies and la women's labor history classes. Anyway, so that. You know, I was wondering, um, Beatrice or B, did you know Sylvia Woods in the course of your organizing? <laughs> she was such a dear friend. So oh, wonderful. Mm. Do you have so, any memories of her? I did not know that she knew her, so thank you for that question. <laughs> well, I'm sure Sylvia uh, thought highly of you too. <laughs> uh, because you understood the need for a unity between black and, and white workers and uh, unity among women workers too, which is so essential then and now. And additionally, I was reminded of a talk I heard at the Democratic Socialists of America convention in 2019, where our, one of our keynote speakers was Sarah um, Nelson of the, you know, the um, flight attendants union. And she told the story since we were in Atlanta for the conference was uh, the laundry workers, black women organizing in the late 1900s, early late 1800s, early 1900s. And so kind of like I'd never heard of that, you know, I mean, I thought I knew a fair amount about laundry women workers, but I did not know about that. And so that was wonderful information to have and that they were victorious in a southern state. Uh, because they were organized and they were the majority. The white people needed their laundry done, you know? <laughs> and so um, the bosses kind of saw that, you know, and so they did win, not without a big fight, but it's always good to celebrate our successes. And I'm sure Beatrice, you have had uh, plenty of those as well as challenges. That's the nature of the work we do. Um, so, yeah, again, it's just these memories of history coming together and then finding out what you were doing is just makes the history much richer. So thank you very much for being here. Um, and I just want to add that I'm, you know, come from Russian Jewish um, paternal grandparents who were active in the Socialist Party and union organizing and Workmen's Circle and a whole bunch of other groups. So uh, it's in my blood and it sounds like it's in your blood, too. So thank you very much. Natasha, if I may ask, where are you? Where did you teach? Uh, I'm in Portland, Oregon. Um, I have taught um, in um, 
as an adjunct, I taught at Portland State University, Portland Community College, and Clark College in Vancouver, Washington. And I've also taught in the public schools. And then part of the time at Portland State, I taught in the labor studies program for seven summers. Um, but as an adjunct, I worked on two or adjunct organizing campaigns with AFT. Well, thank you for joining us tonight. And I think You're we've welcome. got all the corners of the country covered. We've got Chad in Texas, Toru in Boston, Natasha in Portland, Jennifer across the border uh, in, in Toronto, um, and a bunch of us here in Minnesota. Um, well, that's great. Yeah. Thank you, Zoom. Yes, very much. The miracles yes. of Zoom. The miracle. Yes. I want yes. to thank Kip. Kip Dawson, who I don't believe is here tonight, but ah. I'm based friends with her, and so she had publicized this. Oh, great. And so I just thought finally I got a chance to, to attend one of these things because great. I've been doing Black history seminars through, um, through the Zen Education Project, pretty much all the pandemic. Exactly. And so it was good to get this also. So thank you great. all for being here. Thank you. Uh, I thank appreciate you. it. Thank You're you. Welcome. Ryan Murphy, you got your mechanical paw up. Go yeah, ahead. Yeah, well, I didn't know if I was supposed to use the mechanical. Sure, man, oh, anything. Yeah. I know. I'm so, yeah. Um, anyway, the, it's so great to hear a talk, and I agree about um, something that's in the service industry, right? It's it's amazing to me how little is written historically about service work, even though everyone's like all of a sudden in the 1990s, like, oh my goodness, we have to help service workers organize. It's like, well, wait a minute, this isn't the first time. <laughs> that this has happened. And in fact, as B can obviously tell us, like this, these kind of industries that are not manufacturing are so pivotal to the, to the labor movement. And so I guess one question I had, because I'm actually writing a book right now about the Teamsters in the 50s. And the, I think kind of untold story about the way that the, that the service industry is sort of what made the Teamsters so powerful, not the trucking industry, because the majority of the members were in services. Um, but what I wanted to ask you ask is who were the owners of the laundries, right? Because my hunch is that the AFL unions got into the laundries by helping the, you know, small family businesses or medium sized businesses form cartels, right? I mean, that's really how unions grew, which sometimes super exploited workers and sometimes did it. But I wondered also, and if there were sort of ethnic ties there given that the, that the laundries would not have ha had a lot of black workers prior to the thirties because there weren't as many black people in the North. Um, and so I wondered sort of how, what, what were the kind of ethnic ties among white laundry workers and the owners of the laundries and how was the ownership structured? Yeah, this is a great question. And B will have to weigh in on this as well. And even primarily, so B's family owned a laundry um, they so there were two two types of laundries. There were they were called hand there were there were hand laundries and these were tiny shops and there'd be the owner and maybe one or two employees or in in as in B's case like just family members helping out and they would take in laundry sometimes wash it on site. These are like little neighborhood shops and then send it to a power laundry. Um, and, and we can talk a little bit about that in in her neighborhood. Um, it was a lot of um, a lot of uh, Jewish owners of, of these small hand laundries. And then, and then there are also, of course, this huge other sector of, of Chinese owned hand laundries. And I discussed that in, in the book. And that, that's like, like another huge piece to this, which is that it's, it's a long story. Like, so, the, so these little hand laundries, we have sort of the white owned hand laundries, we have the Chinese owned hand laundries, and they, they kind of compete against each other. Um, and they're they're competing with power laundries, except for then they start to use power laundries and, and they bring in the laundry from the neighborhood, send it to a power laundry for washing. It comes back and they do ironing. So there's all these different pieces. So so the hand laundry piece, um, I'll let B talk more about that. In terms of the power laundries, the ownership is all over the place. So we have, and this this also made this industry so complicated to write about. So we have hand laund we have power laundries that have like thirty or forty workers, and then we have power laundries that have five hundred or six hundred workers, right? Like coinciding, like like there's one laundry in in Brooklyn 
by the 30s that has a thousand workers. Now that's the exception, right? Um, the sort of average has like a hundred workers, uh, you know, in terms of power laundries versus the hand laundries. Um, and so it starts with like, it's kind of not this like, and, and we, we can talk about it, it's kind of not this like super high status industry. And so a lot of, a lot of the sort of original people who get into it actually were drivers. And, and they save up a little bit of money, they open a small laundry, they buy machinery secondhand and kind of keep doing, you know, the labor manually. And so, it, you know, we have like a lot, a lot of slippage between drivers then becoming small businessmen in, in the laundries. Um, but then they start to consolidate in the 20s, right? Like we in, in the, the, the decade of mergers and the, so, and so we start seeing like bigger and bigger laundries merging and starting to be controlled by corporations that then get employers associations. Um, and that really kind of changes the industry. Now, just to go back to the Teamsters, um, I think you'll really interesting, like the Teamsters gets really mobbed up, of course, in the laundry industry and, and sets, yeah, like, like there, there's this whole, I have, there's this whole section on gangsterism. And so, and the workers talk about like Adele men is not taking on the bosses only, but also the gangsters who have infiltrated the Teamsters local that represents the drivers in Brooklyn. And um, so, uh, Yes, I think that you're onto something there, and um, I'd be happy to chat more. And uh, I do, I do talk quite a bit about that in the book. <laughs> so it's all over the place in terms of ownership. But um, but you are right to say that they aren't power laundries aren't owned by black workers or, or sorry by by black um, people largely because they can't get the capital to open them. Right, like there's only like one or two that are owned by. Like, like there are a few black owned hand laundries, but very few black owned power laundries just because of the sort of barriers to entry capital competition with the white owned power laundries. Sorry, that was a really long convoluted answer. <laughs> but B, but B, your parents, your parents owned oh, a laundry. <laughs> I wanted to change. In terms of my parents owning a laundry, Tiny. the only employee was my mother. Lion, the, the shirts and starch, the curtains, <laughs> and my father did all the delivery and the, and the marking. I don't call that ownership. Yeah. That yeah. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> and my, they did that, by the way, I think because of the triangle shirtwaist fire where my mother would have been, except that she was on maternity leave. Uh, the ownership, uh, it wasn't monopolized, uh, but it was getting there. Mm. You know, if you have some laundries that hire 500 and some that that hired 50, let's say. Um, and they did have an association uh, which uh, had an influence on, uh, we felt, uh, we meaning in my local, felt uh, uh, on the, the inner union disputes See, they wanted the more responsible union, which was the amalgamated clothing workers. And so it absorbed <laughs> the laundry workers industrial union affiliated to the CIO. Uh, and uh, uh, I don't know what the situation is today. It looks to me like it's more and more monopolized. Yes, Sintas, right? Uh, Aramark, yeah, absolutely. Right. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, Chad, Chad Pearson, you've got your hand up. Wonderful, thank you. Can folks hear me? Yep. Okay, terrific. I'm really excited to be here. I enjoyed the talk, uh, very, very interesting. Uh, I was wondering if you can speak to the question of uh, biracial or multiracial uh, organizing, um, and if you could talk to, the, to the, the issue of how difficult, how involved 
that must have been uh, given given the amount of racism that uh, you know permeated so much of, of mm-hmm. society and i raised this because i recently wrote read the chapter in the 1619 project called on capitalism it was the one most relevant chapter dealing with labor and i thought it was terrible frankly uh the author made the case that interracial or biracial organizing was um, very, um, was the only time it happened was spontaneous and, um, uh, and that white workers ch- chose, um, chose racism and poverty. Uh, and so no one is denying the history of racism uh, among, among white workers, uh, but certainly there are many, many examples of interracial unionism um, and that required yeah. an enormous amount of struggle and risk uh, and confidence. And so uh, I would love for you to speak to this issue um, because frankly, you know, there isn't in the, the collective consciousness, there isn't enough information. Uh, that people don't know as much about this rich history. I don't, you know, we don't want to overstate it, but we also mm-hmm. want to acknowledge, you know, the, the significance of it. So if you could just speak to that, mm-hmm. thank you. Hey, can I let you start because because you were there? I mean, I I I could I want to talk after you in this case if, if that's all right. <laughs> um, my uh, <clears throat> excuse my husband Frank Lumpkin was in the National Maritime Union, the NMU, at that time. An African American. He's African-American, and he told me a lot of examples where when they, uh, both the black and white uh, seamen, members of NMU, when they went into port, Uh, Sometimes a group would hang together. And this group Frank was in, I think in Portland, Maine. Uh, They went one hotel after another and could not get accommodations for the group. And in this case, Frank was the only black in the group. And he told them, he said, Look, he said, I know what the problem is. You go and get a room, room, and I'll go to the black part of town and get a room. And the other uh, men wouldn't do that. Uh, That was uh, a tremendous reinforcement of uh, of unity. so that was true of the mm-hmm. CIO as a whole. Mm-hmm. And it made, it was a difference mm-hmm. in organizing. And it might not have taken, uh, been so widespread as I think it was, uh, if it weren't for the industrial unionism that threw them all into the, uh, same a bargaining unit of struggle. And they got to know each other too. Um, anything else I should say? No, I think that's amazing. And I mean, yeah, I have a story similar to that of a group of laundry workers from New York going to Washington for a, a talk and um, an an interracial group and uh also sticking together like refusing to to go to segregated hotels i don't know if you were part of that group were you in that group that's my story that's your story that's why i said you should go first well i have it in my book when your person's here you know she's she's corrected me in talks i'll be like oh yeah i got that wrong Um, (laughs) um but uh, I think, okay. And, and anyway, it was six of us. Yeah. And it was three white and three black. And um, we couldn't uh, get a hotel together. 
in Washington, D.C. Uh, this must have been for the National Youth uh, Association, was that? It was a great big uh, uh, coalition. Uh, and Mrs. Roosevelt spoke to us on the uh, White House lawn. Well, finally, our driver, who was the cab driver, was black. And he took us to a settlement house that rented rooms. And Chicago, uh, Chicago what's true of Chicago, too. Washington, D.C. was horribly segregated in the, uh, in the 1930s and the 1940s. That, that I'm saying on personal experience. So, uh, I don't know what would you say of it now? <laughs> yeah, no, that's, Chad, that's a great question. And, um, you know, absolutely those, you know, racial divisions in the laundries were, were, were there, but, you know, to answer your question, like, I think sort of two things, because in the thirties, we really do, I do see in the laundries this interracial unionism, um, you know, emerging and, 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 and consolidating that is, is why they can form a union. And I think it's a couple things. I think it's, like incredible leadership of, of organizers like the uh, Dolly Robinson, who are really committed to the project of interracial unionism. Um, and Dolly Robinson becomes really close friends with Bessie Hellman, who, who I would also put in that category, like someone quite committed to, um, to building those solidarities between white and black workers. And, um, and I think also part of it was that those solidarities were forged through the struggle. And that's where I think that kind of like struggle and militant action is really key to like building those, those solidarities, like getting arrested together, like, there were these huge strikes in the Bronx and the Bronx Home News covered it and like hundreds of white and black workers would get arrested in front of the laundries and thrown in, in the vans and taken to jail. And, and I think really out of that common struggle against the employer emerges this, this, this unity, right? Um, but again, but again, I think there was also the deliberate actions of these rank and file organizers like B, like Dolly Robinson, like Bessie, B Bessie Hellman supports, like Charlotte Adelman, who are absolutely committed to, to forging that unity. So I think um, it, it, it is possible, right? And it, it, and it happens through struggle and deliberate action. Thank you, Jenny, for that beautifully said. Oh. <laughs> John Hansen, your your hand is up. Yes, um, I have a, a question. I, I think it'd be for both of our guests. Uh, that is, what did the role of the um, uh, McCarthyism and the anti radical times in the in the forties, when they went after union leaders, especially those that were radical and probably the most effective? What effect did that have also in the racial issue? Because it almost becomes a racial issue too. The, uh, the leaders of these anti-communist movements are also uh, seem to be racists. And I was wondering what effect that had. Mm -hmm. Well, I would say, uh, you're talking about the 40s. You have to talk about during the war and after the war. Mm. Because during the war, um, there was a tremendous advance of uh, the rights of uh, black workers who for the first time entered many industries. Um, I was working after I got expelled from the um, <laughs> Amalgamated Clothing Workers Laundry Branch. Um, I went back to school for one semester, got my degree, the depression was still on. Uh, 
So um, I stayed with industrial work and I hid the fact that I had a degree or I wouldn't have been hired. And I worked in metal uh, assembly shops, that kind of thing. Okay. When the war broke out, they, uh, and plant, uh, the plant I was working in um, was all white. At a union meeting, this was the UE. Uh, does everyone know what the UE was? Okay. Um, the UE uh, organized that plan and they put a motion forward to get um, um, that the local back hiring black workers. I don't know what happened, but the, uh, the person who supported it most uh, then um, voted against the, no, about the journey. Anyway, he pulled the parliamentary trick to prevent a vote because he saw it was going to fail, that we hadn't mobilized to bring out people who would support hiring uh, Black workers. At the next meeting, they were prepared and they passed that motion. So that fight was going on and FDR realized he was not gonna get enough workers to staff the factories they needed to win the war without opening the doors to the millions of black workers. And so he, proclaimed the FAPC, Fair Employment Practice Commission. And in the period of World War II, the fight against racism continued. You know that the army was segregated. I could tell you a lot of stories on that. Uh, and so the communists had a slogan. I, can't say it was widespread, which it was, that we were fighting for the double victory, victory against fascism abroad and victory against racism at home. So in the years of World War II, many industries opened up to uh, black workers who then fought and kept their position. Um, women weren't as successful in keeping their jobs. There were separate seniority lists than the auto shops for men and women. And, uh, no man would be laid off unless they got rid of all of the women. So uh, we could go on and on. But uh, after World War II, with the turn to the Cold War, uh, then uh, the shift was totally in a reactionary direction. And it was not a time of winning uh, further civil rights. Yeah, just I'll just say super quickly. Um, yeah, I think that periodization is important. The 40s has so many different eras, but um, you know, it's it's in 1941 before the Soviet Union has joined the war that. B and the communists are expelled from the Amalgamated Clothing Workers of America. And that timing is really important, right? Because at that moment, Sidney Hillman, the head of the garment union is fighting with the communists in, in New York. Um, he's, he's close to Roosevelt and he's upset with sort of 
how he sees things going. And um, <laughs> somebody just wrote, the more I learn about Hellman, the more I dislike him. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's that this is, you know, if I guess you probably read Stephen Fraser, if you haven't, I, I don't know who wrote that, but, um, you know, the, yeah, not, you know, there's definitely many sides. Um, and so, you know, the communists are out of the laundry union by 1941, Jesse B, all of them. And um, after the war, and, and Adam, Adelman and Robinson aren't communists, but it, you know, I would say that like, of course it affects the union, the cold war in, the, in that narrowing of space for, for radicalism and for, and for civil rights unionism. And just a, a quick example, Dolly Robinson and many black laundry workers had joined the American Labor Party. Um, uh, this is a, a New York state left-wing party that has socialists and communists and, um, and they saw it as a vehicle for, for labor rights, but also, you know, racial justice. And, um, and they, and I remember, you know, Robinson leaves by 49.50 because they're communists in that, in that state labor party. And she's worried about being associated with, with communists, right? And so I think that's just one little example of the ways in which, you know, the Cold War really compresses the space for radicalism and, and um, Black activism. But certainly, you know, I, I, I think I argue that the ejection of, of the leftists from the laundry union, and these are these are folks who, who helped found that union, that, that their ejection 41 w was, was bad news, right? <laughs> bad news for, for the union, for union democracy, and and for you know that continued struggle for for civil rights and and racial justice, which certainly carries on, but you know has lost a really critical ally in in um, in losing and losing the radicals, the the, the communists. Mm. Anyone else? I'm, I'm gonna jump in then and ask a question. Um, you had said, Jenny, when we were talking before we started tonight that you, you started out with a project on the Women's Trade Union League. Um, in your essay and, and in your work, um, you talk about the Negro Labor Committee. Mm -hmm. um, I'm always looking at the past to try to figure out what can we learn that's useful to us in the present? And, and so I wonder if you would say something about these not union organizations that played such an important role yeah. in promoting unionization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, these alliances that the laundry workers forged with the, with the Women's Trade Union League, with the Negro Labor Committee were really critical to their success in the 30s. Um, and I think that, you know, alliances with, you know, and I wouldn't say the Women's Trade Union League and Negro Labor Committee, you know, they're not, they are labor, but they're not unions per se. Right. Um, but but these alliances with 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 labor allies and, and left allies and community allies, right, right. are really like churches. Um, are really, really critical to, to, to labor success. I write the last chapter of my, of my book, just a tiny pitch is it's about a campaign to um, organize Syntas in the early 2000s. And it, that campaign really interestingly used similar coalitions with interfaith worker justice and, um, and the NAACP. And, and so I, I was like, wow, this is so interesting. These coalitions happening in both periods. Now the Syntas campaign wasn't successful, but I mean, the Women's Trade Union League brought in a whole bunch of things that the union movement just didn't have. Um, they had a lot of resources because they had a lot of rich ladies who had a lot of money and also could generate kind of crazy amounts of publicity by through, through their connections to powerful men by coming in, in limousines and that sort of thing. And, um, and then also like, I think it was really important in that era. And I think we could argue there's still use for that is just the really specific focus on gender. Like the Women's Trade Union League provided the space for women workers to come and talk about concerns specific to gender to get training and like in public speaking and sort of things that they, you know, like the ways to navigate a male dominated movement that like intentionally 
like marginalized and and suppressed their their activism and often didn't want them to organize at all right that was arguing for a, a male breadwinner wage so you know i think that that's you know having that sort of separate space that dealt with not just issues of class but also sort of you know gender was very empowering the Negro Labor Committee in a similar way was dealing, you know, with issues of, of race and racism and racist exclusion in labor. Um, and, um, and they, you know, they provided, you know, e you know, enormous support in that way. And I, you know, I often think like, oh, is there still use for sort of like gender segregated spaces for women unionists like Clue or in, and other organizations? And I, I think, yeah, like, why not? Right. In addition to, you know, working with unions, um, because I don't think we can say like we live in a you know completely egalitarian society. Right. Like, <laughs> so um, now be like, I think that B would 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 have a different view of the Women's Trade Union League, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> <laughs> than what I just said. I, I don't know. Je Jesse Smith, um, who was a friend of bees and lived to 100 and uh, was still organizing at 100 for tenants' rights, you know, she was very critical of the Women's Trade Union League, right? And I have, you know, hers, you know, she was, oh, they were just ladies, they did nothing. Um, they were just, you know, publicity machine, you know, and, you know, there's some truth to that in that, you know, they couldn't do the like hard work of go going in the shops and, and organizing necessarily. But at the same time, I, I would argue that there was, there was some value in, in, in what they did. Um, B? <laughs> um, I didn't have any experience. Like directly, yeah. I didn't have any experience with them. Um, but there's definitely a need for community allies. Yeah. yeah, and that's like one thing that they were so grounded in the community. Like it was incredible. Like the and it was just a time you know they were getting support from the unemployed councils, right? The women's councils of, of of the communists. They were getting support from the socialist party, the women's trade union league, the Negro Labor Committee. Like there were just so many incredible labor and left organizations and 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 spaces where support was offered um or support could, could be won and you know that's something that i think is useful to think about today right like where can workers find allies and what can allies do to support workers right now and it might depend on the local branch also mm -hmm. uh some are more active than others. And uh, there was a lot of distance between the Bronx and Brooklyn. Don't laugh now. If you were a New Yorker, you'd know. <laughs> and there's really kind of like, there's huge organizing in, in the Bronx and Harlem, and there's huge organizing in Brooklyn, and those movements are kind of connected and kind of not connected. Mm -hmm. And the reason it's in those locations, I argue, is because there are large numbers of Black workers in, in those locations, right? And power laundries in the 20s start to, like, move to where Black workers are, right? Because, you know, mm -hmm. like, they actively recruit them as much as Black women seek these jobs over domestic service power laundry owners want want these workers because they can pay them less than white workers right because because of racism because of lack of opportunity so like all these things are they're not just happening they're very deliberate right choices are being made by by both sides um, in terms of you know producing this configuration this geographic uh, configuration so we're we're almost uh, at that. our at our time limit um, is there one more? question or comment. Um, Toru-san, we usually rely on you to draw a parallel to Japan for us. Is there any, uh, thank any, you so much. no, no uh, pressure? Just, but. Uh, you know, I just put the information uh, related to today's discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, the Chinese Hand yeah. Laundry Alliance, yes. yeah. which was uh, established in the mid-1930s. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they were not really union. It's kind of a civil rights workers center in mm -hmm. that day. 
but it's really uh, important uh, history, I think, especially yeah, yeah. in today's context, yeah. because yeah. I don't know uh, how they are uh, connected each other, uh, you know, uh, the uh, laundry workers unions and the Chinese laundry uh, alliance, but they might be connected with communist party yes. <laughs> at that time in the New mm -hmm. York City. And so New York City Communist Party had the connection with both organizations, I, mm -hmm. I guess. So in any way, this is really interesting mm -hmm. uh, history. Mm -hmm. So that's why I put this here. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, and they're in my book. And they're actually, they're in my book in lots of ways. And, and the Chinese Hand Laundry Alliance is really critical of the amalgamated. They really, some of the some of the critiques that the workers are saying about the amalgamated sort of being racist and bureaucratic the chinese hand laundry alliance also will also says that you know like oh like we're watching this union like crushing these workers is very interesting so yeah they represent like the owners of the of the chinese hand laundries but the owners are also workers right they inhabit that kind of status as both like sort of owners but also workers like be what you were saying about your family like yeah they own a hand laundry but they were also working class and workers um and so yeah yeah so there's um the chinese hand laundry alliance um is is uh, plays plays a role in this story as well of course an important thank organization you. yeah very important thank you thank, thank you, you totally. yeah. yeah yeah um so Jenny, there's a request for you to plug your book one more time, please. Oh, yes, it is. Um, it's a matter of moral justice. Uh, black women in the fight, black women laundry workers in the fight for justice, University of Illinois Press. It came out last summer in a weird sort of pandemic moment. And so a lot of my talks have been by Zoom, but I'm actually grateful in a way. Like, I think I think without the pandemic, we wouldn't have had this rise in Zoom and I wouldn't have got to talk to so many amazing people. So I've only done one in-person talk and that was in Chicago. <laughs> so, you know, I'm, uh, yeah, super grateful to chat with people about this. You're a great group and um, great questions. And uh, yeah, it was it was a real pleasure to write. It took a really long time. I, I kind of blame the three little boys who were here earlier. They kind of, they made it. We've hopefully gone to bed. Yeah. Oh no, they're like crowding outside the door. But um, yeah, so, you know, the, just such a powerful group of workers. Uh, you know, I think in some ways it was, it was, I kept not wanting to finish it because I just love these women and their stories. And I think they're just, wow, like what they did to organize these shops and the challenges they faced is really amazing and humbling and inspirational. And um, I'm just honored that I got to write about them. I'm really lucky. Um, and, you know, and then I got to, you know, have Bia and, and Jesse for a while and, and some others. And I'm, I'm just enriched by that. And, you know, I have them on my shoulders all the time thinking oh, what would you do you know jolly robinson like these are these right. are pretty pretty great women to meet so right. i hope that i hope you'll get to meet them <laughs> Read thank, the you. <laughs> yeah. thank you yeah, and b, b thank you so much for spending time with us this evening and he is um, amazing. i'm inspired to meet you and and to listen to you um what a treat um to have you with us and um i i just want to say as long as we're we're all here that um john hansen who's with us tonight john is uh writing a book about his father who was in the committee of 100 uh oh. in the 1934 minneapolis teamsters strike oh. um and and i think that john's father is on his shoulder uh much of the time um and ryan who's with us tonight has written a great book uh, on flight attendants unionism and oh yeah yeah right. yeah yeah and Chad is Chad's right. book is about to come out on the violence of employer anti unionism mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. it's, it's an illustrious crew a lot of knowledge a lot of knowledge here uh, this evening and thank you so much for for giving us a reason to have a conversation. Stay well, everybody, and uh, last nice pitch, join, join us on Saturday, July 30th at 1 o'clock Central Time 
uh, for a panel discussion with four Starbucks workers who have just organized their shops here in the Twin Cities. Um, one of whom is a recent graduate of McAllister College, part of that new working class um, and the upsurge. So great. Thank you all.